Good afternoon, and thank you for attending my presentation. My name is Fanny Guillaume Castel, and I'm a PhD student in music and material culture at the Royal College of Music in London. I first began learning the harp when I was six years old. My parents did not play any music, but they had thought it would be a good activity for me to try. Years later, my father, who is a former trade unionist, had admitted to me that he had originally been opposed to me playing the harp, as it was for him the bourgeois instrument by essence. Since then, he had come around and enjoyed listening to me playing. However, this perception of the harp as an instrument for the wealthy stayed with me, as I still perceive that stereotype today when I tell people that I play the harp. Most of them assume that I come from a wealthy background, as they believe all harpists are either rich or from an aristocratic family. While this idea is engraved into popular imagination, it is not something new and is a phenomenon that even appeared at the same time as the pedal harp first became popular in the 18th century in Paris. In this presentation, I will show you what is the reality of the link between pedal harp and luxury in the 18th century. First, I will introduce you to the luxury market hit in Paris at the time and how the pedal harp actually fitted within this market. I will then present you the link of the instrument with the aristocracy, something still very much attached to the instrument today. Finally, I will explore how the stereotype of the pedal harp as a wealthy, aristocratic instrument was strengthened through time up to this day. Economic and cultural historians all agree that it is actually very difficult to accurately define what luxury is, because it is a never-changing social and cultural category. The 18th century in France was a time of an evolving consumption culture. Thanks to a prosperous economy in the middle of the century and to technological advances, manufacturing and production were higher than ever and more people could afford to purchase manufactured goods. This growing number of consumers meant that depending on one's social status, the idea of what luxury was could be very different. For example, Louis-Sébastien Mercier, who depicted the Paris he knew in the 1770s, said that the Parisian who does not have an income of 10,000 livres ordinarily has neither bed sheets, nor towels, nor undershirts, but he has a repeater watch, mirrors, silk stockings, or lace. In the Encyclopédie, writer Saint Lambert writes how the whole of society was actually concerned with luxury at the time, as without an abundance of luxuries, men of all ranks believed themselves to be poor. There lies the actual main function of luxury, a tool to mark one's social status, or as historian John Chauvelin described, the theatre of power that is the display of one's wealth and social distinction in comparison with others. As such, luxury became a crucial part of the representation of the social status of the owners. For the nobility and the royal family, luxury was used to create an aura around them and to dazzle the commoner. This was also a very soft power, you could say. The demonstration of luxury for the higher classes was a way to assert their power without force. Apart from power, luxury was used by aristocrats as a way to demonstrate their qualities. At the time, it was indeed believed that one's exterior appearance was the reflection of one's qualities, whether these were true or fabricated. It is for that purpose that aristocrats sought to purchase for themselves and their interiors the most beautiful and ornate items. But how does the pedal actually fit into the luxury of the 18th century exactly? Musical instruments have actually rarely been studied as part of this market, although the pedal market does share some characteristics with the luxury trade. The evolution of consumption in the 18th century had also led to a, a redefinition of interior spaces, in particular for aristocratic houses. Each room was now dedicated to a specific activity, and the furniture had to reflect this designation. Rooms were to be organized in a specific order. First, the meuble meublant, or furnishing furniture, such as consoles, commodes, or upholstered seats, remained fixed in the perimeter of the room. Second, the meuble volant, or moving furniture, like the small chairs, ottomans, and pedestal tables, were placed at the center where they could easily be moved. The furniture dichotomy is mirrored with the space that was given to musical instruments in interiors. On one hand, small instruments like violins or flutes could be easily moved and put away after practice, while on the other hand, heavier instruments like harpsichords and pedal harps had to stay in one room. 
As these instruments became permanent fixtures of aristocratic interiors, they had to follow the same trends as the rest of the furniture and take part in the theatre of power of their owner. Musical instruments like pedahops were a demonstration of the owner's affinity with music, a quality sought after amongst the aristocracy. By their dimensions, on average 5 feet 2 in height and 2 feet 5 in depth, pedahops would have been a noticeable piece in any interior. They could thus be used as a canvas for the fashionable decorations of the time that would attest of the owner's wealth and taste. Most better hops from that era that you can view on display in museums are often lavishly decorated. At the very least, they bear sculptures on the arm, on the scroll at the top, and on the base, as you can see here on the first hop. These hops are the most frugal you can find. Indeed, in a lot of cases, the soundboard is painted with fashionable decors, pastorals, landscapes, flowers, chinoiserie or Etruscan motifs, for example. Several other occurrences show pedahops with gilded parts, which in some cases are actually decorated with a bronze paint that resembles gilding. These decorations actually responded to the trends of their time. However, the decorations on instruments were rarely signed, so some documents from the makers can bring a better understanding to the making of the decorations. One interesting example is that of Jean Rinat Darman. Upon his wife's passing in 1776, the notary established a list of debts owed by the maker, a list that includes a number of craftsmen. Among them are at least two decorators. One is Monsieur Deschamps, a painter, who was owed 16 livres tensels by Nadarman, and the other is Monsieur Boucault, a gilder, who was owed 2,638 livres. These sums demonstrate the importance of decoration in the process of heart making, and how important it actually was to customers. Although this document only lists two decorators, we know that pedal hops could be fitted with other quality materials. For example, here with this harp by Renaud et Chatelain from the Musée de la Musique, with strass on the soundboard decorations, or this impressive Mother of Pearl insert on this Nademan harp on view at the Château de Versailles. With so many decorations, it is often difficult to know if a pedal harp was actually frequently played by their owner. When they looked so expensive and ornamental, one can only imagine that its sole purpose was to be a token of the owner's sophistication and culture. One of the most occurring clichés about the harp is the figure of the Queen Marie Antoinette. During her education in Austria, the princess had formed a passion for music, as she had learned to play the harp amongst other instruments. After her wedding to the Dauphin, future Louis XVI, in 1770, she played quite intensively and was even portrayed playing in her chambers by Jean Gauthier d'Agoty, pictured here. When she arrived in Versailles, her mother, Empress Maria Theresa of Austria, had asked the Comte Merci d'Argento, ambassador of Austria in France, to watch over her daughter. The result is an abundant secret correspondence between the Empress and the diplomat, in which the latter deplores the fact that Marie Antoinette is too dedicated to music. She talks about the harp lessons that she received, that usually lasted for two hours every day, often followed by a concert in the afternoon. He described this as a waste of time that could be used in a more purposeful way. As an avid practitioner, Marie Antoinette very quickly appointed harp makers to a service, who then used her name as a commercial asset. The first one who received this title was Jean Renaud Darman, whose appointment can be found as early as 1770 in a harp from a private collection. The title of ordinary maker did not automatically mean that the Queen bought items from them, but it was an honorary title without any financial retribution that allowed the maker to boast the Queen's or King's name on his production. For Nademan, we have the proof that Marie Antoinette did purchase harps from him. In the document evoked earlier, the notary also wrote a list of people who owed money to the maker in 1976. This list includes a debt from the Queen Marie Antoinette for 1,050 livres, a substantial sum compared to the other debtors on that list, who owed usually under 100 livres to the maker. Marie Antoinette had appointed another harp maker to her service, Georges Cousineau. The earliest mention of his position is found on a lease for a house in Paris from 1781, on which he is described as a merchant luthier to the Queen. Unlike Nademan, Cousineau's harp are rarely dated, which prevents from determining the exact date of his appointment. Although he did not use labels for his instrument, his harps were often painted with this title written in the decorations, as you can see here. 
Unfortunately, the affiliation of Jean-Henri Dambin and Georges Cousineau with the Queen has led to quick identifications, and a number of their harps have been falsely attributed to Marie Antoinette because they all bear her name on the maker's label or on the instrument. To this day, no real evidence has been found to completely ascertain that any Nadaman or Cousineau harp had actually belonged at any point to the Queen. This is in part due to the sales made during the French Revolution, when the possessions of aristocrats and the royal family were dispersed throughout the country and Europe through a number of public sales, thus blurring the provenance of these objects. Although when thinking of the harp and the royal family of France, Marie Antoinette is the first person that comes to mind, the better harp had been present at the court of Versailles much earlier. The archives of the Menu Plaisir, sort of leisure ministry for the royal court, hold proof that the better harp was played at court as early as 1759. The purchases from then on were all made for Madame, the daughters of the King Louis XV. The first purchase was made for Madame Louise in 1759, when she was only 22 years old. With the bill is attached a letter from a teacher, Gabrielle Louis Besson, attesting to having received the harp and declaring that Madame Louise is very pleased with it. Usually, historiography attributes the teaching of the pet harp of Madame to Beaumarchais, although evidence has yet to be uncovered for this claim. We can at least be sure that in 1759, Gabriel Louis Besson was teaching them, as he signed the letter as harp master to Madame. Other mesdames who had purchased pedal harps included Madame Adelaide and Madame Vic Victoire. When you visit the Château de Versailles, you can admire in Madame's apartment on the ground floor portraits where they have been represented playing music. Amongst them, you can see Madame Victoire playing the pedal harp, pictured here. This painting is particularly interesting as it dates from just a year after Victoire's purchase from Jean Rena in 1772 and the princess still owed 800 livres to the maker in 1776. It is very possible that this debt was for this precise harp, although Victoire's harp is not the one represented on this painting. Indeed, the bill describes the lavish decorations of the harp purchased by the princess, which includes paintings of flowers, varnish sculptures and gilding, which does not correspond at all to the harp in the painting. Although the better harp was already present at court before the arrival of Marie Antoinette, it is sure that her passion led to a rising interest for the instrument amongst the rest of the royal family and the courtiers. For example, the Comtesse d'Artois, sister-in-law of Louis XVI, played the harp and had appointed Georges Cousineau as harp maker to her service. Louis XVI's own sister, Madame Elisabeth, was also an avid harp player, as she is portrayed playing in 1783. In 1779, the princess had even gifted two better harps to her closest friend, the Marquise de Bombelle, as the latter wrote in a letter to her husband. Following the French Revolution, one would think that the practices that had been closely tied to the old regime would have been abandoned. The rise to power of Napoleon Bonaparte did certainly help the instrument to stay relevant in higher classes. What Napoleon established along with the French Empire was a renewal of aristocratic customs from the old regime. As, as nobles from ancient families rubbed shoulders with newly inducted noble families, all aspired to return to the lives of leisure lived by the predecessors. Most important actors of the new regime had been raised in the old regime, including Josephine de Boarnay, Napoleon's wife and Empress in France. She had learned to play the harp as a young girl and was still playing the instrument once on the throne. With a similar effect to that of Marie Antoinette, the instrument became fashionable again amongst the courtiers. She even appointed the son of Georges Cousineau as harp maker to her service. The Château de Malmaison, where Josephine spent her life after her divorce from Napoleon in 1810, still holds a Cousineau harp that belonged to her, as indicated by the decoration using the imperial symbols of the eagle and the bee, which you can see here. The following political regimes all continued to favour the better harp as a marker of aristocratic tradition. The Irar Company, for example, was appointed as heart makers to Napoleon, then to the kings Louis XVIII, Charles X and Louis Philippe, as the company was also chosen for the court of Great Britain and of Russia. Well into the mid-19th century, better harps were still a token for the reigning families and their courtiers. The rise of the Second Empire in France was another occasion for the interest for the better harp to be reinforced, particularly through Empress Eugénie, wife of Napoleon III. As a foreigner to the French court and manners, Eugénie, who was born in Spain, had always felt a close bond with Marie Antoinette, whom she had imagined had gone through a similar experience when she arrived at Versailles. 
As the imperial couple settled in the same palaces where Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette had lived, Eugénie chose to redecorate some of them in the taste of the 18th century. The height of her passion was demonstrated in an exhibition she organized at the Palace of Trianon in Versailles in 1867, during which she presented an 18th century pedaharp. The attachment of the pedaharp with the opulence of the 18th century continued even after the fall of the Second Empire in 1871. For the 1873 World's Fair in Vienna, the Erhard Company created a new model in what they called Louis XVI style. These harps were fitted with a scroll on top of the pillar, as was done in the 18th century, and were lavishly sculpted and gilded. The production of these harps was designed to demonstrate the French industry at the World's Fair, but it is very interesting to note that to best represent the pedal harp production, the Erhard Company thought it best to present an instrument that symbolized what the pedal was perceived as, a luscious and grand instrument, particularly associated with 18th century royalty. However, this model of harps was mostly designed as a showpiece, and very few of these were actually produced, as the fashion for 18th century opulence passed. We have seen that the better harp has remained closely attached to the French aristocracy throughout the 18th and 19th century. Today, this idea of associating the harp with nobility and wealth still persists, as we can see with the representation of the harp in the media. Better harps are, for example, a common sighting in any period piece that shows aristocrats, like in the recent hit Netflix show Bridgerton. When the harp is represented in modern setting, it is usually, as it could have been in the 18th century, a symbol of grandeur and sophistication, as for example here in the backdrop for businesswoman Adrienne Malouf in the reality show The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. These representations are also in accordance with the image that is conducted by the most renowned harp makers of today. Philosopher Olivier Souli described that in the marketing of today, luxury is most often associated with a number of criteria, including a tradition of craft, the rarity, quality, durability, or a high cost. The first question suggested by Google when searching harps is actually, why are harps so expensive? This price is mainly the result of the work of precision and craft that goes into making a better harp. From the design, to the carving of the wood, to the creation of more than a 1,500 pieces for the mechanism, and the mounting of the 47 strings, a better harp takes a lot of time and work to be constructed. The result is that even for entry-level study pedal harps, they can cost about 13,000 euros, or a bit more than $15,000. The price can even go up to $60,000 for certain pedal harps. As these companies offer a high level of customization of the pedal harps, which can easily drive the prices up, they often work with harpists to create particular models, changing the type of wood they use, changing the color, adding ornaments on the sandboard, gilding on the pillar, or even adding a crown at the top of the pillar. Through this presentation, I hope to have alighted part of the root of the idea that the pedal harp is a luxury and aristocratic instrument. The aim of this paper was not to say that the stereotype was completely false, but to better understand what story it actually tells about this instrument. Fortunately, today, as more and more programs are developed around the world for the democratization of classical music, like the project Demos of the Philharmonie de Paris, a wider number of people can have access to the pedal harp, another instrument. Several charities and associations are even dedicated to the introduction and teaching of the pedal harp to a wider range of people, like the Lyra Society in Philadelphia, that teaches the harp to underserved students in the Philadelphia area. Charities like these ones, as well as the renting programs and contracts between conservatoires and harp companies, help to bring this instrument to people who could have thought that the pedal harp was an instrument for the bourgeois. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to hearing your comments and questions.